<laughs> you have doubts. All right, everyone have the textbook open. Good job, Devin. You can always rely on Devin. He's just reliable. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter five, American Revolution. Kaylee, are you there? All right, we'll have Kaylee read the introduction for us. Go ahead, Kaylee. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly, go Fantastic, thank you. And Braden, the next paragraph. Thank you. Thank you. So that there's a key phrase in here that is very provocative, right? And this phrase here that I'm highlighting that Braden um, just read, right? They did not fight that revolution to create a democracy. And you'll notice democracy there is in quotes, right? And the reason for this statement is historically, by definition, um, a democracy is not a static thing, right? It's not just created and then it's done, right? It's, it's dynamic, right? It's ever moving towards perfection, right? We see this with the ancient Greeks, right? If you remember from your world history class, right, in ancient Athens, right, not everyone could vote, right? And yet it was labeled as a democracy, okay? So in all of history, this term democracy is supposed to show for us that um, even though different civilizations have proclaimed a democracy, by definition, this term means that it's dynamic, right? It's, it's evolving, right? And the definition of that word, even though it will change from culture to culture, universally, it's supposed to mean that we're, we're striving to be democratic, right? We're striving to truly be a democracy, right? And when do we know when we're gonna attain perfection? I have no idea, <laughs> I have no clue, okay? But, right, that's a consensus among historians. Let's take a look at that conclusion of our last little section here. Consequences, yes, yes. All right, first paragraph, let's have uh, Talina.
Jack, next one. Historians have long regarded the with the resolution of by President the Biennial The colonists primarily motivated constitutional principles, ideals of equality for economic policy. Was the revolution radical or conservative? The such questions are hardly limited to historical. From Abraham Lincoln's use of the Declaration of Independence in the Gettysburg Address in the 23rd century to the party, wherein he preaches, the revolution has remained at the center of American political culture. Indeed, how one understands the revolution often dictates how one defines what it means to be. Perfect. And last but not least, Cooper, that last paragraph. Thank you. <clears throat> so there at the end there, when it talks about the Declaration of Independence and what Cooper just read, you get that idea that it's something that's ever evolving, right? It's been used, this idea of democracy, especially its connection to the Declaration of Independence has been used um, differently and its purpose has evolved, right? Most of the words, especially in those first 10 Bill of Rights, right, and, the, and in the actual Declaration of Independence, the words have not been changed. But yet, as time goes on, more and more people have benefited, right, from being finally included in those words, right? Even though the words on paper themselves haven't changed, right, past, um, uh, obviously, past the first uh, 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, obviously, those words have changed. Right? But in the actual core of the declaration, the words have never changed, but the people who have been included in them over the years, over the decades and centuries have changed, right? It's evolving, right? It's striving towards something. And that's very important to understand, okay? Um, we're gonna be talking more about this, about what it means to be an American right? and how Americans today define themselves, right? In terms of their identity. Okay, but first we gotta finish our slides, let's get them out. Bam. <clears throat> there we go, we left off here, Lexington and Concord. All right, this is where we left off, right? We're going to pick it up on the next slide. Yep. Thank you, Taylor. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, we all ready? Remember only what's in bold. Right? Only what's in bold. Come on, we're waiting for you, Gabby. Okay, there we go. All right, Lexington and Concord, right? The war starts off horribly for the Americans. And what happens in the immediate aftermath of this, these two battles? Taxation continues, but in terms of the opinion of Americans. Yeah. There's more loyalists, right? There's more supporters of the British crown, right? Especially within that moderate population. Those are going back and forth. <clears throat> Bunker Hill, this is another American defeat, but there's something very different about this one, okay? Most um, Americans who fought at Bunker Hill are gonna come out of it feeling as if they could have won because everything was going their way. It seemed like everything was going the Americans way. And really the American Continental Army only lost uh, because they ran out of ammo. Okay? So the opinion and the judgment that comes out of this is by the local population. Right? They held their own and they stood their ground against one of the world's most powerful militaries, the British Army but they lose still, run out of ammunition. And that's Bunker Hill. There's, some, there's so many famous paintings about this, this battle. Anyone know what that statement in the parentheses means, right? General William Howe right, says a famous comment about the battle. What is that referring to? Very famous in, um, well, not, not anymore, but it used to be famous a lot in local popular culture. What'd you say, Tatum? <laughs> famous statement that he says. <laughs> don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes right you've heard that maybe okay that is said during this battle or well, at least we think it was said right that's what survivors tell us right? who knows that's uh that's lexington <laughs> yeah so for for homework yeah for homework you're going to do a source on the battle of lexington right which is regarded as the first engagement of the revolution right and no one knows who fired the first shot in that battle no one knows who actually started it okay the british say it was the americans the americans say it was the british So, okay, Bunker Hill, there are, so after Lexington and Concord, there are more loyalists. After Bunker Hill, even though the Americans still lose, there is um, a renewed sense of hope, right? a renewed sense of maybe, maybe we have a chance against the British. But still right now, the politicians who are in charge of the revolution, right, they're still trying to find a diplomatic answer, the Olive Branch Petition, okay? They know that the parliament isn't gonna to listen to them, right? They're still taxing them, right? They're, the colonies are not being accurately represented in the parliament, so they're gonna bypass the parliament. They're gonna go directly to the king and ask for his help in the Olive Branch Petition. They're basically going to say, hey, Parliament won't listen to us. 
can you please hear us, listen to our concerns, listen to our needs and complaints? Um, the king does it, right? <laughs> king George III does not. Um, mostly because what bugs him is that still be part of your British empire. You just have to let us rule ourselves. We'll still call ourselves British subjects and citizens, right? But we make our own taxes, right? We elect our own leaders and we'll keep you as king, right? Kind of what, um, very similar to what Canada has today, right? The queen in England is still legally their head of state, right? But she doesn't pass any laws, right? She doesn't pass taxes, right? They have autonomy within the British Commonwealth. That's kind of what the Americans were asking for. It gets rejected. Okay, the king doesn't want anything to do with it. Mostly because he fears the British Parliament, right? They have power over him. So the war continues. Before George Washington, you get uh, this ignorant and unaware man, right? <laughs> Artemis Ward. He's the first American commander. He's in charge of the Continental Army. And he's the exact opposite of George Washington, right? He's only in his role because of his last name, because of status, right? He's not actually a good military tactician. He has no idea what he's doing, okay? A lot of historians place the blame of those early defeats on him. The war entirely changes after George Washington takes over, right? Entirely. So on the um, unit study guide for the exam, you'll see his name shows up, right? Artemis Ward. On paper though, it looks like this should be an easy win for the British, right? On paper, everything seems to be in favor of the British army. Right? They have more resources, more money, more supplies, more men, right? They have a huge empire from which to get resources from. The American colonies do not have anything like that. The British army is one of the most disciplined military outfits in the world. That's one of the reasons why they were able to beat the French in the French and Indian War, right? The British Army was known to be more disciplined, known to be more structured and organized. The typical American soldier and American Army unit um, is the exact opposite, right? The stereotype, right? We're using stereotypes here, but very undisciplined. George Washington had to use whippings and floggings to stop his men from desecrating a town. Right? Their own American towns had to stop his men from abusing alcohol, right? So the British soldier, the stereotype, disciplined, confident, on the verge of being arrogant, right? The American soldier is the exact opposite. Some of them have no prior military experience. Some do from the French and Indian War, but most of the new recruits have no experience. They're farmers. Right? They're switching out their pitchfork for a musket and they have no training. And so on paper, again, it seems like this is an easy win for Britain. Hence why there's still a good, strong, loyalist support. Because how on earth is an American army made up of those types of men going to win? Well, you sort of get an answer to that question in the film, The Patriot. I remember when um, the character that Mel Gibson plays, he doesn't, he avoids meeting the British army right, in an open field. He knows he can't win uh, most of the time in that kind of battle. Right? He uses guerrilla style warfare, right? Going in the woods, attacking, then retreating, running away, attacking, retreating. Right? That's the kind of tactic that is going to benefit the Americans, okay? Not conventional, traditional warfare. Uh, 
there's a parody song about this. I'm not going to play for you guys, but very important still, very important. Thomas Paine. Some of you guys might have heard his name in previous um, history classes. He okay? writes a book called Common Sense. Thomas Paine is British, right? He's not an American, right? He's British, but he writes this because he's convinced that the Americans have some valid reasons. And in fact, in his pamphlet, he tries to persuade more American citizens, well, not citizens, they're not citizens yet, but more Americans to join the cause, join the patriots. And that's Thomas Paine. And his book, Common Sense, um, that's one of the terms that is listed on the study guide. He's British, yep. He was viewed as a traitor back in England. He was well known, but this is this obviously makes him, you know, very famous. Yeah, yeah. He he had some authority at least. He was respectable. I know Tatum. Uh, let's see, twenty-two. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so again, this is a guy, right? Thomas Paine and his book, Common Sense, right? There are terms on the study guide, or at least common senses, right? The name of his pamphlet. Who is the author of the Declaration? Who writes? the Declaration of Independence. Who is it? Braden? Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson. Right, he's the one who actually writes the darn thing, right? He gets ideas from other people, right? From writings, from things that he studied, from other members of the of the colonial elite, but he's the one who actually writes it down on paper. Okay, Thomas Jefferson, Declaration of Independence, 1776. This is a, a bold moment in not only American history, but world history, okay? Because for the first time in history, a part of the British empire is going to fight for its independence, okay? The American colonies are the first part of the British empire to fight and win for their independence. What happened? <laughs> Abby, it's all right, it's okay. I'll just edit that part out of the recording, okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> De Devin, you should memorize his entire address and then say it for the class. <laughs> the Gettysburg Address? Preamble? Oh. <laughs> All right, let's make sure we got this copy down. Mm -hmm. There's a song? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe we'll listen to it. <laughs> okay. Everyone got this? This phrase down here, right? All men are created equal. Um, this phrasing of this is still contested, but it's very noteworthy that immediately after this is written, it's 
going to be contested, right? The way that is phrased, right? We'll get to that on the next slide. <clears throat> good? You good, Tia? All right. Actually, I did, didn't I? Oh, dang it. Okay. <laughs> I thought I did it in my head. Okay. Anyway, this very prominent woman of the era, Abigail Adams, she's going to be one of the first people to call into question that phrasing, all men are created equal, right? One of the first moments immediately after the declaration is written where someone's going to say, what do you mean by all men? What about us? Like, we're, we're playing a very important and huge role in the revolution, right? So this is the first questioning of that statement, right? Abigail Adams. Huh? Yes, yes. Right, so she, she's well known, right? She's well known. She's married to one of the more prominent um, founding fathers, and she questions this. Okay, there's obviously all, also going to be some questioning about the African Americans, right? Remember, in the film The Patriot, we do know that some of them are going to be promised liberty. Um, only a handful, a few dozen, are actually going to get that promise delivered. Uh, so it, again, it calls into question the purpose and meaning of the declaration and what do what does the word liberty mean? What does the word democracy mean? And who is included in that? Okay, you get the first questioning of that here. Abigail Adams. <clears throat> battle of Trenton, right? For these ones up here, you just got to write down the battle and the year, right? Battle of Saratoga, this is the turning point. Okay, that's why turning point right there is in capital letters, right? This is what finally convinces the French to get involved. Because okay, before this, the French are just watching, right? They're saying, hmm, do the Americans have a chance to actually beat the British? If they do, then we'll help them, right? The French were very sneaky in that way because they only wanted to give help to the Americans if they felt that the Americans could have a chance to win um, because then they would be implicated in the victory, right? Britain and France are long historical rivals. The French want a chance to get back at the British, right? After the Battle of Saratoga, that happens. Okay, the French promise a fleet. They promise uh, thousands of troops. They promise money. They promise supplies. They promise food. And eventually, the Americans are also going to be helped by the Spanish, right, through supplies and some money. Because essentially, no one likes the British, right? And they all want to get in a potential victory against them. The French join, the Spanish join. Anyone seen uh, Hamilton? No, or have heard of it? It's, it's very famous. It's a very famous song, right, involving the Marquis de Lafayette. Maybe. Yes. Oh, he was? <laughs> oh, yeah. Not going to waste my shot. Yep. So, again, Battle of Saratoga, turning point in the war. Who's still copying this slide down? Elizabeth, your people, Annika. Okay. I'll, I'll wait at the end. Annika, you good? Elizabeth is good. <laughs> I think you do that whether she wants to or not. <laughs> All right. 
What happens at Valley Forge? People starve, people die, right? American morale is at its lowest, okay? The only hope that the Americans have at this point is that things are going to get better because the French promised support, money, food, supplies, actual pants and jackets that don't have holes in them, okay? Actual muskets that can fire properly, right? actual training for those undisciplined soldiers. Okay? That's the only thing that is keeping up some semblance of hope in on the American side. French support is coming soon. Okay, but in the meantime, they have to suffer, they have to starve, they have to be depressed. And like Cooper was mentioning, some are going to die at Valley Forge. They have to spend an entire winter without proper uniforms, proper shelter, right, proper protection from the cold, proper nutrition. French promise a lot of money, which is ironic because that's what's going to plunge them into debt and start their own revolution in France. And the king who gave that money, he's going to lose his head. It's a very ironic twist of fate for the guy. <clears throat> there's still a, there's a reconstruction of the fort at Valley Forge in Pennsylvania to this day. You can go see it. It's pretty cool. Everyone good on that slide? Thanks, Abby. The British feeling as if the tide of the war is now on the American side are gonna concentrate to try to win the war in the South. Right? We, we see a recreation of that in the film, The Patriot, right? With General Lord Cornwallis, right? He tries to turn the tide of the war back into the British favor by trying to defeat the American armies in the South. He has some success in the beginning, but eventually even him, this prominent military commander, is not able to truly defeat the Americans in the Southern colonies. Right, remember Lord Cornwallis, right, in the film, he's portrayed by the guy with those two dogs, right? If you remember from the film. Yeah, and then Mel Gibson stole them. In some of your PowerPoints, some of you guys mentioned Benedict Arnold. Why is he famous? He was a traitor. Okay, he's a traitor. He pretends to be a patriot, but deep down in his heart, he's a loyalist at the core. He wants to remain British. And he's going to betray his colleagues and give secrets over to the British. He's going to surrender a major fort at West Point right, to the British. And he's regarded as America's most famous traitor, Benedict Arnold. He's also one of those ID terms on the study guide. That's Cooper. Nathaniel Green. Nathaniel Green. America's most famous traitor. There's also a good parody, parody song about him, but. <laughs> Remember they're posted on that, on that teacher's YouTube channel. <laughs> I 
<laughs> You're so much. Oh. <laughs> 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 well, Georgia was named after a British king, right? So, well, yeah, it's because we kept the name. We kept the name. We kept the British name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Yep. <laughs> All right, next slide. The final battle. You're close. You're close. <laughs> Yorktown. Yorktown. There are going to be some minor um, skirmishes and conflicts that happen after this, but this is the last major battle. Right? And even though the war continues for a little bit after this, the British morale and the British mindset after this specific battle is this is a lost cause. Right? The Americans are basically already independent. They control most of the major towns, not all yet, most of the major towns. And now that the French are here, they have a navy that's supporting them. They have tens of thousands more troops on their side. It seems as if this is a pointless war now. And we're just spending money, right? We're getting more into debt. The Americans actually never repaid us from the French and Indian War. Now we're fighting another war. Right? Now the British crown is even more in debt. Right. Again, right? It's the last major battle. There's still going to be some minor fighting after this. Until 1783 with the Treaty of Paris. By the way, there's like 25 treaties of Paris in world history. They like to go there a lot. <laughs> they like to go to Paris to make peace. You know, it's a good city to make peace. Everyone have this copy down? <laughs> Treaty of Paris. What happened, Brayden? Oh. Hang on, hang on. Let's let's wait for Brayden. Good? Yes. No, I, I think this is like number four already. I said 25, but I think it's really like 19. Yeah, something like that. I think so. Yes, I think so. Make sure you got this copy down Treaty of Paris. The main tenant of this treaty is. Britain is forced to recognize America's independence, right? But they're going to be kind of um, resentful about it, right? They're going to keep troops in New York City, in Savannah, in Charleston for two years after this, right? In some cases, five, ten years after this, right? They're going to say, well, we haven't moved out all of our stuff yet, right? So you got to give us more time. That's one of the causes of the War of 1812 against Britain again, right, is that the British 
are taking their sweet time moving out of the, Ameri of the 13 colonies. But the Treaty of Paris ends the war. Okay, that's also one of your ID terms on the study guide, Treaty of Paris. Treaty of Paris of 1783. Well, that's why I'm gonna, I'm gonna write it as Treaty of Paris of 1783. After you got this slide copied down, right, get out your uh, journal. Right, you're gonna have a short journal entry here. Yes. Let me make sure everyone has this one first. Okay. Everyone have this? No, Elizabeth? Yep, you're right. <laughs> All right, Monica, good. All right, let's see. All right, which one, Kaylee? This one, okay. Which one? Artemis, okay. All right, guys, guys. <laughs> I just have to censor Tatum throughout this entire recording. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pretty sure I said that in the beginning. Oh, she missed it. Yep. <laughs> it's all right when, when when he comes next week he'll be like so who's the girl who's talking about urethras again <laughs> yeah but he's a cool guy don't worry there you go <laughs> wait what seven what do you think <laughs> 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 it's okay, Tatum. It's all right. You're you're just being yourself. It's all right. <laughs> I said, don't be you. Be normal. <laughs> Let me know when you're ready, Jack. Good. All right. Here's a journal entry. Okay. In your journal. And this can be as short or as long as you want it, right? As long as you're writing it down because next Friday, I'm gonna check to make sure you have the journal entries. I just put up the prompt, Selena, there it is. Again, right, that has to do with that, that element of pride, should there be an element of pride when learning your country's history, right? Talked about that very early in the semester. Okay, once you're done with that journal entry, all right, let's get out a, a blank page, either blank sheet of paper or, or on your iPad for the audiobook. 
Remember, today's session of the audiobook is probably the most graphic one. Okay, so yes, and she's gonna speak like she speaks. Yes. Mia Ellis. She's just trying to earn money. She's a PhD student, right? She's just trying to earn money. For this, all right. Um, no, 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 no. Someone else wrote it, but you get accepted into like this pool of narrators. And well, yeah. Someone liked her. I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right, decide if you're going to do it on your iPad or on a blank sheet of paper. Full page, full page of notes. Full. Okay, so we're gonna listen to this part of the audio book, right? And then if we have time, we're gonna briefly look at the study guide. Remember Friday, it's just a day dedicated to looking at the study guide. And um, since it's the first uh, exam of the semester, right? It is gonna be graded on a scale. So whoever gets the highest grade, right? That's, I'm gonna use that grade as the scale for everyone else. Okay, but that's only the first exam. It's only this one. Okay, it's only this one. <laughs> <laughs>